Perfect. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rima Bakta. I'm a PGY1 resident at Erlinger. Today, I will be talking about my research project called Comparison of Recombinant Factor 7A and Prothrombin Complex Concentrate for Uncontrolled Bleeding Related to Cardiac Surgery. The following authors have nothing to disclose. The objective of this presentation is to compare the efficacy and safety differences between low-dose factor 7, high-dose factor 7, and PCC in patients with bleeding related to cardiac surgery. For our project, we defined low-dose factor 7 as less than 30 micrograms per kilogram. To begin with some background, cardiac surgery is associated with a high risk of blood loss due to many factors, such as the surgery type and putting patients on bypass. It's reported that up to 20% of all blood transfusions are required for cardiac surgery patients. And transfusions are associated with an increased risk of postoperative mortality, uh, length of hospitalization, renal morbidity, and institutional cost. Finding alternatives to blood products is important due to shortages and their adverse events. Hence, factor products such as Factor 7 and PCC have been investigated and used off labelly These products have been shown to reduce postoperative bleeding, transfusion requirements, chest tube output, and need for reoperations, but they do have a potential increased risk of thromboembolism due to the imbalanced procoagulant and anticoagulant in them. There are currently limited direct comparisons between agents. There is some evidence that suggests PCC has a lower thromboembolism risk than factor seven, and this new literature has led to a practice change here at our institution. Erlinger is a level one trauma center and academic medical center that has a cardiac thoracic surgery service composed of two CT surgeons who on average perform 550 cases per year. At our institution, practice has transitioned from using 90 micrograms per kilogram of factor seven to 15 micrograms per kilogram to help steward the factor products and ultimately reduce the adverse effects and the costs that were associated with the higher dosing. Now we have moved to using PCC more based on provider preference. So our, the purpose of this project is to determine if low dose factor seven, high dose factor seven or PCC requires less packed red blood cells transfusions within six hours of factor product administration, especially since the literature has not yet compared these three strategies to each other before. To achieve our purpose, we performed an IRB-approved retrospective single-center observational study. We included patients at least 18 years old who underwent cardiac surgery between November 2016 and July 2021, who received either Factor 7 or PCC during or after their surgery. We excluded pregnant individuals, those who are incarcerated, anyone with congenital bleeding disorders, those who required ECMO during their admission or refused blood products due to personal or religious beliefs. Our primary outcome was transfusion requirements of packed red blood cells within six hours of receiving either low dose factor seven, high dose factor seven, or PCC. Our secondary outcomes included other transfusion requirements within 18 hours, the need for additional factor products after the initial one was given hourly chest tube output up to six hours before and after the factor product, the hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, thrombotic events during their admission, the need for reoperation due to bleeding during admission, and acute kidney injury defined using the rifle criteria within three days of surgery. In our study, we screened 235 adults and included 222 adults. We included 78 patients in the low-dose factor seven group 43 in the high dose factor seven group and 101 patients in the PCC group. Our primary exclusion criteria was the use of ECMO. We collected data through chart review through EPIC and paper charts. And then we analyzed the nominal data using chi-square or Fisher's exact test and continuous data using students t-test. In terms of demographics, our median age was similar between the three cohorts in the 60s. There was a significant difference in gender with more males in the PCC group and median weight with slightly lower weight in the low dose factor seven group. Overall pre-op antithrombotic use was similar, but more patients in the high dose factor seven group had 
used PTY12 inhibitors. And the cohorts had similar and low rates of requiring pressure support devices, such as IAPPs and impellas. The majority of the surgeries we included in our study were open and elective procedures. There was a significant difference in the number of robotic procedures compared to open procedures with more robotic procedures in the high dose factor seven group. The median bypass duration was between 80 and 90 minutes and was similar between the three cohorts. This table breaks down the specific cardiac surgery type in each of our three cohorts. Surgery type wasn't a mutually exclusive variable, hence why the total numbers are greater than the sample sizes. About 50% of each group underwent a cabbage. And there was a significant difference in the number of AV repair slash replacement with lower cases in the high dose factor seven group. In terms of dosing, the median dose for the low dose factor seven group was 15 micrograms per kilogram. High dose factor seven was 86 micrograms per kilogram and PCC was 524 units, which is equivalent to one boxer vial. The median time to dose from surgery end was significantly different between the groups with longer time to give the dose in the high dose factor seven group, which matches our institutional practice changes with giving larger doses of factor seven later on to help treat those refractory bleeding cases as opposed to now we give low dose factor seven and PCC more early on during their hospital course. For our primary outcome, the majority of patients did receive packed red blood cells within six hours of giving their factor product. And it appears there was no significant difference in the packed red blood cells requirements. There does appear to be a trend towards maybe less requirements in the PCC group. However, there is a wider interquartile range here for some of our key secondary outcomes, there was a significant difference in the number of patients who required additional factor products with more of the PCC cohort requiring additional factor products. There were no differences in reoperation rates between the cohorts or thrombotic events in ICU and hospital length of stay, but perhaps there is numerically higher rates in the PCC group. There was also a significant difference in, the ho in hospital mortality with more patients uh, dying in the PCC group. We do plan to meet with a statistician to perform a secondary analysis to evaluate this outcome further. In terms of median chest tube output up to six hours before and after, our data suggests that the output was reduced to similar levels after the factor product was given, as you can see in the highlighted red box. It is important to note that the data for the complete six hours of output prior to factor product was not available for all the patients due to interoperative administration, especially with PCC, since that is available in the OmniCell and the OR, or product administration earlier on than the six hour cutoff, as we can see by the median time to factor products. And in the post-operative course, as we talked about giving low dose factor seven or PCC earlier on than high dose factor seven is how our institution was practicing at the time. In terms of AKI based on the rifle criteria, the majority of our patients did not have AKI and there was actually similar rates between risk and injury and failure. To conclude, there, our studies show that there might be similar e efficacy outcomes in terms of controlling bleeding including the PAC red blood cell requirements within six hours, chest tube output and reoperation rates. There are similar safety outcomes in terms of the rates of thrombotic events, AKI within three days in hospital and ICU length of stay. Uh, there were more patients requiring additional factor products after PCC was initially given, but this kind of leads way for potential dose optimization in the future. Some of the limitations of our study is that it was a retrospective single center study over five years and the hospital did go through a transition from paper charts to an electronic medical record. There are also possible confounding variables, such as the majority of patients had already received other blood products prior to the factor product, and surgery types and methods may also vary in bleeding risk. Matching patients will help us overcome this with the help of a statistician. There is a low incidence of thrombotic events in our study, so we are un underpowered to detect a statistically significant difference that we saw with the PCC group having slightly higher percentage in that area.
and it might be more appropriate to compare low dose factor seven PCC as our practice change has shifted it away from the high dose factor seven. I would like to conclude this presentation with a self-assessment question. What is one major safety concern with the administration of factor products? Be correct. <laughs> I would like to thank my project team for their help throughout this research project. And I would like to open it up now for questions. If you have any. <laughs> yes. Based on our study reports, is, the question was, is there any recommendations we can go ahead and make to uh, the factor products? Since we have three cohorts, our statistics are a little harder. So I think with the help of the statistician, we will actually see if we have clinically relevant outcomes, especially with the thrombotic events, because that's our big concern with the factor products. At this point in time, I don't think I would have any personal recommendations. All right, good afternoon. I'll be talking to you about my research, which is titled Pharmacist Influence on Documentation of Contraceptives in Women on Category D or X Medications in an Academic Primary Care Setting. I would like to note that none of the individuals listed on this slide have anything to disclose at this time. So a little bit of background, we know that pregnancy category D medications are ones that have demonstrated evidence of fetal risk. However, their benefit um, of use in pregnant patients may outweigh the risks in certain patients. Um, in contrast, category X medications demonstrate evidence of fetal risk and that always outweighs their benefits of use in pregnancy. With this in mind, um, previous literature has shown that rates of documentation documented contraception use or sterilization are between 18 and 50% among women prescribed category X medications. So implementing strategies to minimize the prescribing of category D and X medications in pregnant patients, as well as focusing on pregnant, pregnancy prevention and women of childbearing age receiving these medications is crucial to ensure fetal health. The teratogenic medications I'll be talking about today are listed on this slide. These include warfarin, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, statins, certain anti-epileptics such as carbamazepine, lithium, phenobarbital and others, as well as benzodiazepines, which are divided here on this slide between category X and category D. And the purpose of this research was to assess the rate of contraceptive documentation and counseling in women of childbearing age prescribed potentially teratogenic medications at an academic primary care clinic before and after pharmacist intervention. So this study took place at the UT Family Practice Center, which is an academic family medicine clinic in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They serve about 6,000 active patients with about 110 patients seen each day in clinic. The clinic has 18 family medicine residents in addition to 10 faculty physicians and has one clinical pharmacist who participates in things such as diabetes, hypertension, and warfarin management in addition to many, many other things. And the primary objective of the study is to look at rates of contraceptive documentation in the medical record before and after pharmacist intervention. The secondary objectives were rates of counseling about teratogenic risks before and after pharmacist intervention, rate of patient follow-up with an outpatient provider, and barriers to counseling and contraception prescribing for family medicine providers. So women were included in this study if they were between the ages of 18 and 45 years old, and if they were prescribed at least one potentially teratogenic medication between July of 2019 and February of 2022. 
patients were excluded if they had documented surgical sterilization or were postmenopausal. Um, they're also excluded if the teratogenic medication on their chart was a short course of benzodiazepines that were prescribed just prior to a procedure such as an MRI, or if their teratogenic medication was inpatient use of a category D or X medication. So after receiving IRB approval, the first step of this study was to distribute a survey to family medicine providers. This survey asked questions about their likelihood of performing certain tasks such as uh, counseling on teratogenic risk when prescribing these medications or their likelihood to prescribe contraception in addition to these medications. And it also had an open-ended question about what are their specific barriers to this practice in their current practice. The next step was to perform a chart review assessing patient demographics and documentation of contraception. So in the ideal practice, when a patient is seen at the clinic, they're roomed by a nurse and the nurse goes through um, certain tabs in the chart to fill out the most up-to-date documentation. Two of these tabs are listed here. The first is surgical history, which is where the nurse could update any type of surgical history, including hysterectomy or tubal ligation, which is something I was looking for. And then the next tab is sexual history where the nurse can ask about sexual activity as well as current contraception. The next step was to interview and counsel eligible patients, update their EHR and arrange follow up with the primary care provider if indicated. And the final step was to collect the interventions made during these follow up visits. So initially 268 patients were identified, 112 of these patients were excluded because they met one of the exclusion criteria that left 156 patients included. I contacted all 156 or attempted to contact all 156 of these patients, at which time 26 did not answer after three tries or declined to um, speak with a pharmacist. This left 130 patients who are reached. Of these 130, 54 patients were not actually taking the teratogenic medication, so I updated their medication list in the chart. Eight patients had surgical sterilization that was not documented, so I updated this in their surgical tab as well as their sexual history tab. And then that left 68 patients who were eligible to receive counseling on their teratogenic medication. So the demographics of these 156 patients, the median age was 36 years old, the most common ethnicity was white at about 67%, followed by African American at about 29%. And the most common type of payment was 53% private insurance, closely followed by about 43% of patients who had Medicaid. So this is a distribution of the medications that were found on these patients. So the most common teratogenic medication prescribed was benzodiazepines at about 45%. The next most common were ACE inhibitors and ARBs at about 60, or excuse me, 34%. And these were followed by statins and then anti-epileptics. So the primary objective, which was documentation of contraception in the EHR before and after pharmacist intervention, is displayed here on the left of the 156 initially included patients. There's a rate of con contraception documentation of about 38%, which is consistent with previous literature. This left 62% of patients with no documentation in the chart. After pharmacist intervention, so after I contacted these patients, the population is down to 102. This is because some patients were excluded after I talked to them on the phone and found reasons that they um, met exclusion criteria. But after talking with these patients, 74% of them had documented contraception. The 26% who still do not have documented contraception are those 26 that were not reached by a pharmacist. However, a note was left in the chart so that the next provider who sees them will know to discuss this with the patient. So this difference was statistically significant with uh, using a chi-square test. So the secondary objectives were um, counseling about teratogenic risk. And as you can see here, all 68 patients who were eligible for counseling did receive that counseling. And then another secondary objective was follow up with a provider. And so seven patients did end up scheduling a follow up appointment with the primary care provider after speaking to the pharmacist. And the third secondary objective was related to the survey that was distributed to family medicine providers. So this survey was um, had about a 75% response rate. 21 providers filled it out and they it was an open ended question of what barriers they were currently facing to the 
current practice of counseling um, on teratogenic medications. The most common barrier identified was limited time during primary care appointments at about 37% response. The next most common barriers were limited experience with female patients of childbearing age prescribed these medications, as well as lack of familiarity with which medications are potentially teratogenic. This was followed by the assumption that female patients OBGYN would address this issue, alert fatigue, and um, the fact that female patients are often undecided about family planning. And then the last barrier was lack of integration of counseling into the current workflow at the clinic. So anytime a pharmacist is able to reach a patient, there are plenty of additional opportunities for counseling. And so a couple of the other opportunities I had were to talk to patients about appropriate actions to take with their current teratogenic medication when they do plan to become pregnant. I also got to discuss the duration of efficacy for IUDs and implants. Um, this was a common contraception type at that clinic. Um, I discussed the thrombotic risk of estrogen containing contraception in patients who are currently smoking, as well as perform some smoking cessation counseling and medication reconciliations. In conclusion, pharmacist intervention resulted in a statistically significant increase in documentation of contraception in women of childbearing age prescribed category D or X medications. 100% of eligible patients reached via telephone received counseling about the risk of their medication and time limitation was the most commonly reported barrier um, to counseling from primary care providers at the clinic. So some next steps for this project. First, I'll perform provider education, presenting these results to the providers at the clinic, as well as educating them on the teratogenic medications that they should keep in mind in their current practice. Next, I'll redistribute the same uh, provider survey to see if there's any changes in their current practice. And then finally, I'm in the process of generating an interactive reminder in the EHR. The goal of this will be when a provider enters in the order to prescribe one of these teratogenic medications, an interactive reminder will um, appear that reminds them to counsel about the teratogenic risk, reminds them to address the issue of contraception with their patient, and then this will leave a documentation on that medication that it has been discussed with the patient. So it's now time for a self-assessment question. True or false, rates of contraceptive documentation in the EHR significantly increased after pharmacist intervention. And that was true. I would like to acknowledge Dr. White, Bradford, and Close for their help on this project. And does anyone have any questions? Great question. So the question is, is this interactive reminder um, in EPIC going to be outpatient or inpatient or both? So we're starting with outpatient um, because that is a little bit separate and just to get that going. But the goal would be to incorporate that into inpatient EHR in the future because a lot of these medications are prescribed inpatient and then carried on outpatient like antiepileptics, statins, things like that. So first step will be outpatient, but that's the goal inpatient too. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. You want your mask back? All right, hey everyone, my name is Kelsey Heinz and I'm a PGY1 pharmacy resident at the Erlinger Health System. And today I'm gonna to talk with y'all about my research on the role of pharmacists in the weaning and discontinuation of agitation and delirium medications after ICU transfer. I'd like to start this presentation by saying none of these listed individuals have anything to disclose. The objective of this presentation is to compare medication interventions made when patients transfer from the ICU to a receiving team with or without a clinical pharmacist. So agitation and delirium are common complications that occur in ICU patients. Although current guidelines do not recommend routine pharmacologic treatment as the first line in these ICU patients, it's often necessary to prevent patient and staff harm 
However, there's a lack of guidance on the duration of this treatment. Medications like antipsychotics and benzodiazepines can be detrimental to patients if they are continued unnecessarily. Antipsychotics come with the risk of increased QTC prolongation and the risk of increased mortality if used in elderly patients with dementia. While benzodiazepines come with the increased risk of falls, daytime sedation, and sedation or <laughs> cognitive impairment, I'm sorry. Um, pharmacist involvement in the patient care team can decrease potentially inappropriate medication use and minimize the incidence of adverse drug effects. My research was completed at the Baroness Erlinger Hospital, which is the main campus of the Erlinger Health System. It's a level one trauma center, it's a tertiary referral hospital, and it's an academic medical center with 441 acute care beds and 104 critical care beds. So the purpose of my research was to evaluate the impact of a clinical pharmacist on agitation and delirium medication de-escalation in patients after they transfer out of the ICU. The primary outcome was the number of medication interventions made by pharmacists on schedule or as needed agitation or delirium medications post ICU transfer. The interventions of interest will include things like dose decreases, medication discontinuation, and medications change from scheduled to as needed. The secondary outcomes include the number of newly initiated agitation or delirium medications continued at discharge, the use of antipsychotics in elderly patients with a documented history of dementia, and the incidence of adverse drug effects associated with agitation and delirium medications like QTC prolongation and sedation. This is an IRB approved single center retrospective study comparing agitation and delirium medication de-escalation between patients with and without a rounding pharmacist on the team. Patients were identified through a generator report detecting patients that transferred from the ICU to the floor with at least one agitation or delirium medication. Data was collected through chart review and nominal data was analyzed using a chi-squared test or a Fisher's exact test while continuous data was analyzed via a Mann-Whitney U test. At the study institution, antipsychotics are commonly used for delirium when non-pharmacologic interventions are unsuccessful. And both antipsychotics and benzodiazepines have been commonly used for agitation. Here's a list of the antipsychotics and benzodiazepines that are located on the formulary at the study institution and the ones that were included in the study. Patients were included for review if they were at least 15 years old, admitted to the ICU at Erlanger Hospital and transferred from the ICU to the floor with at least one scheduled or as needed agitation or delirium medication. Patients were excluded from review if they were started on their home agitation or delirium medication at their home dose, received a one-time dose of an agitation or delirium medication or were pregnant or incarcerated. When comparing baseline characteristics, there was no significant differences between the groups. However, when comparing the primary outcome, there was a significant difference seen between the groups. 90.2% of patients with a pharmacist on the team had a medication de-escalation compared to 37.1% of patients without a rounding pharmacist on the team. Overall, patients with a rounding pharmacist on the team had higher percentages of therapy changes compared to those patients without one in all three categories of therapy change. Medication discontinuation and medications change from scheduled to as needed were the two medication interventions with a statistically significant difference between the groups. In the secondary outcome data, there was no significant difference seen between the groups except for the number of patients with an anti a newly initiated antipsychotic continued at discharge. While the rate of newly prescribed agitation or delirium medications at discharge was higher in the group with the pharmacist on the team, this study collected discharge disposition data to provide further explanation into the type of medication management that patients will receive once they left the study institution. When assessing this, I found that patients in the pharmacist group were more likely to discharge to a facility compared to the patients without a rounding pharmacist on the team. And that was at 59% versus 37% of patients. 
So medications like antipsychotics and benzodiazepines commonly need to be tapered down prior to discontinuation. And pharmacists have the ability to provide a tapered medication regimen with specific dose weaning instructions when patients discharge to a facility. And this is something that commonly occurs at the study institution to avoid inappropriate long-term use. When comparing the use of antipsychotics in patients 65 years or older with dementia, there was no significant difference seen between the groups. Upon further investigation, four patients in the pharmacist group and two patients in the non-pharmacist group did discharge on a newly initiated antipsychotic. However, I did wanna note that all six of these patients did discharge to a facility for further medication management. When assessing the number of patients with a change in their QTC while on an antipsychotic, the study defined a change in their QTC as at least 50, a change of at least 50 milliseconds from baseline. All patients did receive an EKG before an antipsychotic was initiated. However, there was no difference in the number of patients that received an EKG after the antipsychotic was initiated, and there was no difference in the number of patients with a change in their QTC from baseline. I provided this graph here to illustrate the level of sedation that patients did experience when they were on an agitation or delirium medication. Sedation was assessed utilizing a surrogate endpoint of PT participation due to the lack of standardized monitoring on floor patients. Prior to the medication intervention, incidence of missed PT visits due to sedation was similar between the groups. However, within seven days of intervention, the incidence of missed PT visits due to sedation was less in the group with a pharmacist on the team. However, this was not statistically significant. Thus, including clinical pharmacists on the multidisciplinary team and medical step-down units does decrease potentially inappropriate agitation or delirium medication use after patients transfer out of the ICU. The study did not find any difference in the number of newly initiated agitation or delirium medications that are continued at discharge, the utilization of antipsychotics in those elderly patients with dementia, and the incidence of adverse drug effects. However, the results from the study do validate the impact of having a clinical pharmacist on the receiving team when patients do discharge from the ICU to further manage medications and optimize patient outcomes. The data from our study does support more pharmacist positions in this role. Some strengths of the study include it, it's a direct comparison of uh, medication de-escalation between groups with a pharmacist on the team and those without pharmacists on the team. And then it also has um, further investigation into the type of therapy adjustment that was made. And this was something that was not done in previous studies. Some limitations of the study include the lack of documented EKGs after antipsychotic administration and the lack of a defined time frame from the administration of an antipsychotic to a documented EKG. There is also some potential for confounding variables when assessing sedation in the patients and overall the reliance on accurate documentation in the patient chart for several of the data points. So we will conclude this presentation with a self-assessment question. Does having a clinical pharmacist on the receiving team decrease potentially inappropriate medications continue from the ICU? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'd like to acknowledge my co-investigators, Dr. Garrett and Dr. Carter. And does anyone have any questions? Yeah. The PT, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Small 
Okay. Um, Yeah, we had to get creative with this one because, I mean, it's hard to assess um, sedation, especially on the floor. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jesse Briscoe. I'm one of the PGY1 pharmacy residents at Erlinger Health System in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And today I'll be presenting on the incidence of acute kidney injury and traumatic brain injury patients treated with hypertonic saline. Before we get started, I'd like to note that none of the investigators that participated in this research or this project have anything to disclose. The objective of this presentation is to determine the incidence of acute kidney injury and traumatic brain injury patients treated with hypertonic saline. To give you some background on this topic, hypertonic saline is the mainstay of pharmacologic treatment for traumatic brain injury as it reduces secondary injury by reducing intracranial pressure and improving cerebral perfusion pressure. Superphysiological hyperchloremic solutions have been associated with hyperchloremia and clinically significant hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and acute kidney injury. Literature that has been focused on the association between acute kidney injury and hypertonic saline has failed to examine non-hypertonic saline sources of chloride, such as diluents, um, sodium chloride tablets, and um, other fluids administered. Also, previous literature did not focus specifically on traumatic brain injury patients. And this is significant because this is a unique population due to its demographics, concomitant traumatic injuries, and its augmented renal clearance. The primary outcome of this study was to um, look at the incidence of acute kidney injury on traumatic brain injury patients who have received hypertonic saline. And secondary outcomes were the incidence of acute hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis in correlation between chloride load and development of acute kidney injury. To give you some background on how we define different topics throughout this study, acute kidney injury was defined utilizing KDGO serum creatinine based criteria. Hyperchloremia was defined as a serum chloride level greater than 115 millimoles and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis was defined as an arterial pH less than 7.35 or venous pH less than 7.31, a bicarb less than 20, a serum chloride greater than 115, and then an anion gap between three and 14. This research was conducted at Erlinger Health System, which main campus is a level one trauma academic medical center. Um, and our traumatic brain injury patients are treated by our surgical critical care service. They are not managed by a separate neurocritical care service. Additionally, we use 3% hypertonic saline that is not routinely transitioned to sodium acetate. In terms of methods for this study, we initially obtained IRB approval for our retrospective observational study and then identified patients with a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury via our institutional trauma registry. We screened patients who received at least one dose of hypertonic saline between November of 2017 and August of 2021 for inclusion. Nominal data was analyzed either utilizing a chi-squared or Fisher's exact test, and then continuous data was analyzed using a Mann-Whitney U test. Patients were included if they were at least 12 years old, admitted to our adult surgical critical care service, had a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, had an ICU length of stay of at least 72 hours, and received at least 24 hours of continuous hypertonic saline or 500 milliliters of cumulative hypertonic saline boluses within a 24 hour period. 
Patients were excluded if they had baseline renal dysfunction, which we defined as a creatinine clearance less than 15 milliliters per minute or end-stage renal disease requiring hemodialysis prior to admission. We also excluded patients if they received hypertonic saline solely for hyponatremia and not for their traumatic brain injury itself. In total, we included 130 patients. 110 of those did not develop acute kidney injury, while 20 or 15% did develop acute kidney injury, which lines up with previous literature that has examined the incidence of acute kidney injury um, in other populations who have received hypertonic saline. So now we'll move on to demographics, and these will be broken down between our acute kidney injury and no acute kidney injury groups. And you can see that in terms of age, sex, and BMI, there were no statistically significant differences between groups. But if you look at the median age between the AKI and no, K no AKI group, while this was not statistically significantly different, um, it definitely could be clinically significantly different with the medians um, of the AKI group being 62 versus 40, which is a good bit younger in the no AKI group. So now we'll move on to baseline demographics in terms of injury severity um, and hospital stay. Starting with Glasgow Coma Scale scores on admission and discharge. Again, these were not statistically significant between groups. I did want to highlight that that baseline um, Glasgow Coma Scale score of three between both groups is likely more indicative of the patients coming in intubated and sedated rather than their actual level of injury. But we do get more information about their injuries from the injury severity score and the abbreviated injury scale of the head, which was also not statistically significantly different between groups. There were no differences in terms of hospital or ICU length of stays, and also no differences in terms of intracranial pressure monitor placement, or in-hospital mortality. So now we'll break this down into some more subgroup analysis, starting with more information about the acute kidney injuries that did occur. You can see that typically acute kidney injury occurred around day three of hypertonic saline therapy. And only one of the 20 patients who developed acute kidney injury went on to require renal replacement therapy. 19 of the 20 patients who developed AKI um, were classified as KDGO stage one AKI, which is the most mild form of AKI on the KDGO scale. In terms of mannitol administration, there were no differences between the number of patients who received mannitol um, between the groups, and there was also no difference in the average mannitol dose received. In terms of concomitant nephrotoxic medications, we define this as vasopressors, vancomycin, diuretics, um, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, and then piperacillin and tazobactam. And there were also no differences in terms of the number of medications that the two groups received. And then finally, there were no differences in terms of diabetes insipidus requiring DDAVP between the groups. Now we'll look at baseline and maximum lab values between the groups. Starting with baseline serum sodium at the top, you can see that the two groups had rather similar baseline serum sodiums as well as baseline serum chlorides and baseline serum creatinines. And again, there were no statistically significant differences. Moving on to maximum serum chloride, um, this was statistically significant with a p-value of 0.018. Um, but I would like to highlight that I do not think that this is clinically significant as both of the numbers between the AKI and no AKI groups are actually numbers that we would target when treating patients with traumatic brain injuries with hypertonic saline. So now we'll move on to uh, maximum and change in serum chloride levels. These were both statistically significant with the acute kidney injury group actually having a much higher um, change in serum chloride and maximum serum chloride. The difference between the AKI group and no K AKI group was 126 versus 123. Um, so we're still working on determining if that is clinically significant um, in terms of our analysis. Finally, the maximum serum creatinine level was statistically significantly higher in the acute kidney injury group, which was to be expected. 
Okay, so now we'll move on to this graph that looks at serum chloride throughout hypertonic saline administration. On the y-axis, you have serum chloride. On the x-axis, hospital day. And then the pink dots represent the group that developed acute kidney injury. And then the blue diamonds represent the group that did not develop acute kidney injury. You can see that the pink trend line that represents acute kidney injury um, those patients were more likely to have higher serum chloride levels that went up throughout um, hypertonic saline administration versus the group that did not develop acute kidney injury represented on that blue trend line that remained relatively flat and did not increase significantly throughout administration. In terms of average daily chloride load, which is represented in milliequivalents of chloride, Starting from the left, in terms of total chloride load, this was not statistically significant between groups. So this included um, chloride that was administered from hypertonic saline and other chloride sources. In terms of hypertonic saline chloride load in the middle, you can see that this was statistically significant between groups with the group that did not develop acute kidney injury actually receiving more chloride than the group that did develop acute kidney injury, which is actually the opposite of what we thought would happen when we initiated this study. On the right, you can see the chloride that was administered from non-hypertonic sources. Again, this is from diluents, other fluids, and salt tabs. And this was not statistically significant between groups. I did want to highlight that we thought it was interesting that the non-hypertonic sources provided almost as much chloride as the hypertonic sources themselves. And this is especially significant since previous studies have not looked at chloride sources that were administered from non-hypertonic saline sources. In terms of chloride associated abnormalities, these are all listed in percent of patients um, with the actual number of patients above the bar on the graph. Starting from the left with hyperchloremia, this was not statistically significant between groups. And then moving to the right to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, again, this was not different between groups. In conclusion, the incidence of acute kidney injury and traumatic brain injury patients treated with hypertonic saline is similar to that seen in other populations, but tends to be relatively mild when graded on the KDGO scale. Maximum chloride level rather than chloride load may be associated with the development of acute kidney injury and traumatic brain injury patients treated with hypertonic saline. Moving on to our next steps, we plan on publishing the data that was just presented as a pilot study to a multi-center study that will examine the association between chloride load and chloride level and traumatic brain injury patients treated with hypertonic saline. We anticipate that this multi-center study will include nine different sites. We'll finish up with the self-assessment question, and this is true or false hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and acute kidney injury are two adverse effects associated with hyperchloremia. This is true. I'd like to acknowledge my co-investigators um, and now I'll open up the floor for questions. Anyone? What? Okay, if there aren't questions, I will put the CE code up on the screen for you guys. I didn't use your phone voice. I also I was making a mistake of like smiling at y'all and then y'all would pause and then I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> it's not looking at the thing I saw you. Oh no. No. Uh 13. This I thought was easier to follow. Oh good. Um, should it be mandatory?